So, my name is Jorge Gonzalez. I'm a professor from the City College of New York, in the and Reading. And I'm a Puerto native. We also the former department chair of the University of Puerto Rico, Maya West Haitanica, in the department. And it's a great pleasure to be here with, uh, with you in this uh, forum that is so, so crucial. Uh, I want to make sure that we have Dr. Carmel in this one line, and then we have two or three or two or panelists that will be joining by phone. So perhaps, uh, yeah, we'll see whether the, who is the, the panelists are. So we can just everybody. Yeah, we have two panelists. We can go off. So we have uh, Efraim, Efraim, and then we have Efraim, and also Rodolfo Serrano. So these are attendees at four, and then panelists. The two panelists. Yeah. No, we just start with Jorge, this is Robert Point. I'm using I'm using Oscar Melendez link. Trying are you there? Hola, hola. Can you hear me? Okay, very good. All right, thank you, Elise. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start, and uh, we have two. Uh, Panelists that may enjoy the uh, uh, phone. Uh, and we have the big task today of uh, discussing this critical topic of uh, energy. And uh, I'd like to take a few minutes to put the, the panel in the, in the proper context. And, uh, as we all know, so the Hurricane Mar Maria passed over the island. Uh, a little bit longer than the uh, long, and the has sustained waves of 175 miles per hour in locations, and that crushed the uh, energy infrastructure of the island. And, uh, <clears throat> with that, uh, uh, tied to that is uh, we refer to that infrastructure as a critical infrastructure, meaning that it's interconnected to. Uh, multiple services across the island, and this is uh, uh, the typical scenario. Uh, however, uh, something uh, has happened that uh, the rest restoring of that critical infrastructure has been very slow, and to a point that is so far the longest blackout and extended blackouts in the history of the U.S. Uh, meaning that uh, we can probably hear again Sandy or Katrina, a number of hours that people, we, uh, all of them, uh, people having it on power already exceeded the, uh, the past record. This is how many people have been without power uh, cumulative uh, already is at the ranking. The infrastructure of the island. Uh, <laughs> It has a total capacity of around five gigawatts. Uh, just in the, when we put that in the context of New York City, uh, New York City has a demand of, what we call peak demand, of around 12 gigawatts. So the infrastructure and consumption in the island is about one third of what New York City is. So this is, it gives us a sense of comparison. Uh, between uh, the two locations. The generation system is mostly oil based, 
around 75 percent. Uh, oil, oil number six, this is petroleum, uh, and it has some generation with coal, some generation with natural gas, and around 2% of solar and wind energy. And the 2% is an emerging field uh, uh, in the portfolio generation over the past few years, almost in the last 10 years or so. So it, it, that por portfolio of uh, distribution is similar to most of the other islands, and even similar to most places in the, in the state, is said that the, uh, the percentage of generation by uh, oil is uh, replaced in our cases by natural gas and coal. But it's just it's a very traditional system. So <clears throat> when we talk about that, the infrastructure of the island, uh, it may, may be uh, out of there or no, it actually resemble a, a typical scenario in most modern places. 99% of the uh, people in the island have electricity, so those 99% electrification mean that somehow the, the power lines were getting to everybody's home just prior to uh, Bolivia. And uh, as we heard from Ellen earlier this morning, only around 80% uh, uh, or around in the, in the other way, only around 20% of the island has a uh, power restore. So this panel will uh, discuss what happens uh, and how we move forward uh, in the in the recovery of the Puerto Rico in the particular case of the energy infrastructure. Now we have uh, four uh, colleagues that uh, are with me in this panel. Uh, my colleague here, uh, Galvin Stevenson from Intech Investment Group, also he teaches at the, <clears throat> at the Pratt Institute at NYU. Yeah. Uh, we don't know if, it, yeah, we have the same participant, perhaps. No, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, he, will, he will come in as, as he's going to come in as the panel. Um, yeah, he's there. Yeah. yeah, he's right there. Okay. And, uh, of course, and then we have uh, my colleague, uh, Brian O'Neill Carrillo. He's a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Puerto Rico, Maya West. And we were colleagues when, when, when I was there about 10 years ago. Also, we was at least we were uh, at the same campus at the time. And Brian is an expert in renewable energy and also. We have a petition that we must think the camera is from the angle. The fact that the table should have been in the front of the camera is not. But if you but if you can well, either move the oh, table yeah. or the angle, is that all right? Uh, it, well, you can see if you see the place or not. All right. I'm going to have a little for the pictures. Okay, we, we manage, okay. If all you right. Do, if you have a complaint, just, just uh, send a donation for next time. <laughs> we have a I don't know if I can see those. It uh, also, then we have a uh, Rodolfo Serrano. He is joining uh, via phone. Hopefully, he will uh, have a chance to join us. He has his own uh, energy company in the island, and he is a solar energy installer. So we have two folks on the ground, and uh, we have also Armando Santiago Vitado, uh, who is with the Provincial Cam Campaign Coordinator, and he will tell us a little bit about what uh, we do. So what I thought was that uh, we break down the the panel into two big questions. What happened and uh, what is the current state of affairs in terms of the energy infrastructure? And then in the broader questions about how we move forward uh, to have a resilient uh, energy infrastructure, both in the short term and also in the long term. What are the options for, for the island and uh, how they will move from the current state into that? Uh, uh, in that longer term, a uh, very uh, resilient uh, stage, and uh, on that options about what may be uh, the proper portfolio for the island, uh, and how we get there in terms of uh, financing options, uh, and a few other other uh, topics, and then how, what we, we have learned also from other experiences that could uh, give us a light to illuminate a, a, a solution for the path forward. For example, Sandy, what we learned from this other disaster that we could use those 
uh, lessons learned to uh, rebuild uh, Puerto Rico. So uh, with that, uh, uh, let me make sure that whether we can have access to, uh, I think we lost uh, uh, Brian again. Yeah, yeah it's, we have, it is no, it's not, no, we don't have it yet. Okay. Oh, it's uh, Oscar, you see the, the new Oscar? So Oscar, Namos, Namos, P, uh, yeah. Can you please give me access? I'm, I'm using Oscar's uh, right. account. Yeah, so can you give me access to voice? Yeah, so Rodolfo, can you hear us? Can you give us a sign that you are there? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I'm using I'm using Oscar Menendez link. No. Yeah. 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 The solar company that is the company of uh, Rodolfo Serrano, uh, it is called Neo Era Energy. Neo Era Energy. So, uh, as we get uh, Rodolfo and Efrain uh, on board, when I open the, 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 the Creo question, no entrado tampoco. when I let uh, Galvin to uh, tell us uh, your perspective, how things, what happened. And uh, with the energy infrastructure, uh, why the system collapsed so badly? Uh, it too historical, you know, uh, uh, you know, historical, you know, not only uh, conditions uh, in the context of not only the island, but also the context. I don't have a lot of expertise. Quick comment. Uh, the infrastructure was not in good shape. It was built in the. 30s. Uh, PREPA is, in spite of having some excellent uh, uh, talent, uh, uh, the, the employees can be quite good. It's not a well run organization. And uh, there was uh, there was some, some graft in terms of the influence of the fuel oil, and there was just never a real effort made to, to move into a modern energy system. And despite the fact there are some wind farms there, uh, a lot of individuals were doing. Uh, solar PV and uh, solar thermal had been around for a long time. It was on a lot of houses. Still, it was not in good shape. Very good. Uh, Armando, you want to ask something on what do you think happened to why the system collapse? So, uh, you know, so very good. So, I actually have a somewhat different uh, take on, on what happened with PREPA. PREPA actually began its it's public history in the 1940s, and it took over 40 years worth of investment to get its distribution and transmission uh, grid over into every home in Puerto Rico. So electrification took over 40 years and many billions of dollars worth of investment. Most of that, uh, most of the line power lines in Puerto Rico are, are aerial installed, they're not underground. The expense is incredible, and the environmental damage to uh, the island is also a consideration for uh, essentially taking the lines, the lines underground. You said 100% of the construction lines are above ground? No, not 100%. No, 100% of, of homes in Puerto Rico have are electrified. So Puerto Rico is an 100% electrified place. When it, um, with its short size, it's 100 miles by 39, it's 111 miles by 39 and a half miles. It's, <clears throat> that island, our island has 2,500 miles worth of transmission lines and over 31,000 miles of distribution lines, making it one of the 10 largest power grids per square mile in the world. Getting that much power, that many uh, power lines back up and, and ready in mountainous terrains is going to take a tremendous amount of effort, a tremendous amount of investment. And that is not where private investment wants to go in. Private investment wants to get its money into power generation, not power distribution, not power transmission. Um, PREPA's capacity, as our, as our moderator um, said earlier, 
Our current portfolio has about 2% of renewable energies. Half of that, uh, like half a percentage point, is from the older hydroelectric, hydroelectric uh, power plants from the prior to the 40s, that were built prior to the 40s, um, that haven't been kept up to date. And another half percent and a half is solar and wind. The government, however, did spend enough money between 2009 and 2012 purchasing power production from renewable sources that would get power of our portfolio up to 26%. There are currently 1,600 megawatts of power purchasing agreements. Um, the end of it. Uh, currently, sorry, sure. yes, that are current, but they're not operational. Most of them are not even operational because uh, Prepa's power grid can only really withstand and stabilize no more than 300 megawatts. So they purchased over four times the grid's capacity to stabilize renewable energy. What did they need to do in order to increase capacity? Well, they needed to upgrade, right? Because a lot of the power plants. Were originally built, the ones that are currently standing and, and supporting the grid were built in the 70s. There was a short uh, transition period that started in the mid 2000s to convert a lot of the old oil six uh, generating units into uh, dual field capable combined cycle units. And that was carried out throughout like half of the generation plants. The other half was pending new investment, but that new investment that built. It was actually funded through um, through debt issued by Prepa. That money never found its way into new equipment. If you had been able, if Prepa had been able to invest in these new in these new um, generation units, they would have been able to sustain and stabilize a greater amount of the 1,600 megawatts that were already purchased for renewables on the island. Um, over the last three years, Prepa went from being the number one uh, amongst APBA uh, public utilities for clients and revenues to essentially being the largest bankruptcy of a public utility in the U.S. to 20% um, reduction in personnel for maintenance to the grid, um, 20, 23 to 25% reduction in maintenance alone, preventative maintenance. So. The reason why, and we already had a huge fire last year, about the same time last year, October of last year, a huge fire took out, um, did another huge um, blackout in the island. 70% um, of the grid was affected during Hurricane Irma, even though it was storm level winds. And now we had a 100% blackout um, after Hurricane Maria. The difference being that after Hurricane Maria, now that a lot of the reports that we're getting about 20%, 15%, uh, of the grid being back online, the government had to come clean recently that that statistic actually doesn't have anything to do with the amount of clients on the island that have power back on. That 20% that they say is back up and running is a 20% of the generating capacity of the people in the the system. It's not the people getting back onto the grid. It's not distributed. It's not distributed, correct. Yeah, no, so yes, a, a great a intervention here. So I I concur that the a, the distribution has been the the the, uh, uh, the biggest uh, impact impacted uh, uh, infrastructure on the entire grid and is the expo is the exposition or the Entire distribution system is mostly exposed. So, in the context of a uh, comparison to other major cities, uh, such as uh, New York City or Miami, where there is a significant underground infrastructure, this uh, infrastructure in the island, as most uh, tropical location, is heavily exposed. So, you, you can imagine that having a storm with 125 miles in Long Island, we will be without power for a very, very long time. So. It's, it's just uh, the way that the system is designed in, in tropical locations. Um, that we don't think in terms of a, a good percentage of the, of the distribution system to be uh, protected. And uh, that protection uh, gives idea about possible uh, resiliency uh, down the road. Uh, there is another point that uh, 
uh, I'd like to compliment on the Armando's point uh, on the distribution is if the location of the generation, uh, the, all the four gigawatts uh, of uh, generation are distributed across the coast. Uh, most of that is in the south. So don't show the the system, the, gener the, the generation and where the energy is delivered eventually down the road. And uh, probably uh, I don't have a, a clear a, a clear picture of the state of the major generation plants, but I, I suspect that they are in reasonably good shape, particularly the, the two newest plants, the natural gas and the coal plants, uh, they are probably ready to generate, but where they generate to, to work. So there is no connection in, in that case. So that is a sense of probably that the priority is to get that, uh, that distribution system uh, up, uh, up and running. Uh, sure, yeah. yeah but, what, what I did is a uh, really nice uh, yeah. uh, graphics, which will be on on, uh, on the website. website absolutely, yeah. So you, you can see where the, uh, the generation plants are and where the wires go, where the transmission. If you have to share that, we agree with the panelists yesterday in a, in a call for to show, you know, the visuals because they may not have access to any visual at all. So all the fashion visuals. <laughs> So all this uh, generation is uh, distributed very uh, all at, around the island. And uh, there's uh, one interesting uh, story that is happening is that uh, the western side of the island, Maya West, uh, has uh, some power. And uh, uh, part of that is because uh, there are some uh, very old uh, 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 diesel plants in the, in the town. And uh, it means that they are somehow uh, independent and they could be disconnected from the main distribution line and is powering the entire town because they, they are many locations that uh, they just, uh, the local distribution went off. But the university and the hospital are up and running. And that is a sense that uh, perhaps is part of the solution is to be that uh, is having systems that are somehow uh, independent. They are available to be connected, but at the same time, they can run on its own. And that is probably a lesson that we could all learn uh, from that. So it seems like a part of the solution is already in place. This is a, a, a very nice example in Maya West of a microgrid. Yes, this is the modern microgrid uh, uh, solution. Why is the uh, generation? Uh, I don't have a clear picture of uh, why uh, is that, but I suspect that is due to two factors. Uh, one is uh, the uh, access to the uh, to the fuel. So the, the south is has a pretty good port and uh, is connected also to a very large uh, energy infrastructure from the 60s and the 70s. And uh, that was the largest refinery in, in the whole region at the time. And uh, the other point is about uh, security. So it's, it's somehow uh, it's a location that is uh, safe and, and secure, as opposed to be uh, so exposed in, in the San Juan area. So the new, the new model plants were built then uh, uh, in the south for access to the power. There is a, a, a oil a power plant that has one gigawatt in, in uh, Guayanilla. And there are two major plants that are in the, uh, in the southeast coast in Salinas. One is, a, is a, 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 I mean, oil plant that is coupled to what we call a combined cycle. And the total generation is about, between those two plants, about a, a little bit more than one gigawatt. So more than half of the generation is, uh, uh, was already there. The two newest power plants were also built in the south. One natural gas, which is uh, uh, owned by the liquefied natural gas, and one coal. The coal is in Guayama. 
Hypoelectrica and uh, AES, and then the uh, natural gas is in also nearby Guayanilla. Again, access to the ports, to the distribution points in there. So that was two thirds now with the newest power plants all in the south. And uh, very leaser in the northern parts, and no generation in the central part of the island at all. And that's a very unusual uh, generation and distribution system in comparison to any other major uh, system. So I wonder if, uh, yeah, okay, very good. Do you think now is the time to think about solar and wind energy? Because okay. there's a lot of states here in the United States that have gone through that way, and even in the world, and they have saved a lot of money to the uh, consumers. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, maybe one of the key solutions. The island is, is, uh, is moving in that direction, a little bit uh, slow, but again, when we compare with the current uh, state generation, I think the, the case is about is about the same. So we can ask the question whether uh, uh, the part of the, the mid-term solution or long-term solution will have to, we need to uh, have that local uh, generation by renewables that somehow are really independent from, uh, from, the, from the grid. So and that brings us to the, then the, the second big question, no? how we move forward. What is the role of uh, of these tubular generation systems, such as solar, uh, renewables, but there are also other, other options. So I'm gonna take a question here. Yeah, um, why is the emphasis on keeping that coal burning plant alive? It's created a lot of health issues. I've lost contact with my friend in Paris Garcia after September 20th, but he was really fighting, you know, the whole uh, ash issue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. And we have to continue more the same. Yeah, I, I looked at the map as to where the industry, especially the pharmaceutical industry, is, is located. It's in the north between Bay Alta and Atillo, and they're about to pull out of Puerto Rico. Because they're not, not getting power, they're not giving, they haven't been given priority. I know my town, Vega Baja, has its own plant. It's called uh, it's, it's diesel power. But that has to be touched. That plant alone could fuel the uh, water purification plants that's in Vega Baja that covers Manati. All right? Meanwhile, these sewers are backing up, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't see like, any preparation for what the emergency that is going on right now doesn't make, and also I don't see any projections for the future on behalf of BEPA and, and the so, power. So, so, so your questions on the coal power plant. So this coal power plant uh, is the latest plant. It was built around 2002 or three. I know Nestalí for many years is an environmentalist uh, in the island. The privilege to participate with them on, uh, on the environmental impact for AES, uh, doing all the environmental modeling for the plants and uh, AES and uh, the impacts on the community. Uh, so uh, I believe that the issue we call is uh, saying that natural gas uh, is a uh, 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 is because of the availability of uh, fuel. Coal reserve, along with natural gas, uh, are becoming the, the new oil. Uh, there is so much uh, uh, availability of those resources for worldwide for uh, the next uh, hundred years. And uh, uh, so access to that fuel uh, is uh, far more cost effective, of course, uh, when we quantify the health effects, that's a, a big issue. But I can understand that in any conventional system, again, looking, uh, if you put in the perspective that the Puerto Rico energy infrastructure is as conventional as 
almost any, even the U.S. Uh, state, right? Mm -hmm. And as conventional uh, as any other Imagine. most modern countries, we will expect that type of portfolio because uh, unless there is a more progressive agenda and a longer term vision to have a, a cleaner uh, option. Yeah, me... so the issue of, uh, uh, of coal plants, in fact, the Caribbean yeah. is moving to a lot of more coal plants. Yeah, we can recall it also uh, uh, with a few new power plants just based on coal. And uh, most of the next generation of energy in China, for example, is also based on coal. So it's availability of the, of the fuel. So the question is uh, whether we have a cheap energy versus environmental impact is it's a, it's a, it's a constant question that we, we need to pose. Now, the island has other challenge in managing coal that is and a money in the ash, okay, because it's an island, where do you deposit the ash? The coal power plant has a, a, a byproduct of the generation that is ash. And that has been a big issue, where do we ship, or the island is shipping that, that particular, uh, uh, you know, by waste, you know, by, by product on, on, on the case. So, uh, uh, on, on looking forward, will coal be a solution? That's a big question. Because again, where uh, do we get the, the, the fuel to power these large uh, power plants? So it's the next uh, major fuel that is widely available is natural gas. On the island uh, move uh, more into natural gas. Uh, again, so far the island is generating 75% of oil. Oil is very expensive and is uh, is not as available. The, the fossil oil are declining very fast and in comparison to the natural gas and the alcohol. So is the shifting in, in the in the mixed portfolio should include uh, those uh, fuels that are more available to any location around the world? That's a big question. Okay. This. Okay, so the availability of coal in Puerto Rico is essentially non existent. It's also an, uh, an imported fuel for Puerto Rico. The, I don't think it is a question. So the reason why coal is so prevalent in places like the United States or in China is because it's, it's one of the oldest fuel sources. It's not because it's a new technology. Um, and people are trying to make it, uh, cheap energy as opposed to better energy. The presence of coal in Puerto Rico started in two, after 1998, the governor of Puerto Rico allowed for uh, regulations deregulation of uh, the power generation in Puerto Rico where private companies were allowed to come in and co-generate with uh, PREPA. Um, AES Corporation, they stepped in saying, well, we can bring our, our coal generating plant to Salinas and Guayama. Um, but government of Puerto Rico, we'd like you to pay the bill for that. So the government of Puerto Rico issued that to pay for AES to build their coal power plant in Guayama. And through that deal, the government of Puerto Rico with technically AES is supposed to pay back the debt that was incurred for that, but they pay they pay that debt out of the power that PREPA purchases from AES. So it's the people of Puerto Rico that are still paying for the debt that was incurred for coal. The coal isn't actually even very competitive in terms of price in Puerto Rico because they're actually whereas coal in the US would be sold to power generator. Uh, Power generated from coal would sell like five cents to eight cents per kilowatt hour. In Puerto Rico, it's actually sold at 14 to 15 cents. The reason for the disparity is that into the into that agreement with AES was built in a safety net, uh, like a, a safety uh, system for shipping out of Puerto Rico the coal that was generated, the coal ash that was generated from uh, coal burning. Instead of using that money that they got from PREPA to dispose of the coal ash adequately, they were just dumping it in the Dominican Republic from 2002 until 2005. Child deformities and other illnesses that were provoked in, because of this dumping in the Dominican Republic ousted AES from the Dominican Republic and they just started piling that ash onto people in Guayama, Humacao, Benuelas, as you well know. So now we're trying to get them to to ship that back to where they originally were supposed to ship those products back to, which is Colombia, which is where this coal is coming from. But they won't do it 
unless we agree to another rate hike. So this is a problem, and it, the problem originates from a, a financial structural problem. How we finance these new developments in Puerto Rico and PREPA is problematic and has been problematic. And this is a really new problem that we never really had to face before because coal wasn't part of Puerto Rico's technology for powering the island in the first place. Yeah, we're going to give a chance yeah, to yeah. Galvin and then we go to the audience. Yeah, yeah. Galvin. Can I, I, I might, yeah, people here might want to have contact with other people who are interested in energy in Puerto Rico. So I'm going to uh, pass out uh, a completely opt in um, a email attendance list. Can't guarantee who's going to get it, what kind of email you'll, you'll get. So it, it's completely up to you. Um, I will Thank take you. responsibility for kind of uh, spelling everything out and sending out the first round. But that's all I can yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Let me, let me go to the audience and we take a few questions from the chat. So I have a question about the efficiency of how we're generating our energy. And so in regards to the hydroelectric plant, my question is, I understand that it needs a lot of upgrades, but in terms of generating power from the water, and I know we talked about wind and solar, but I just, in terms of efficiency, what's the, what's the balance? If you think about it? Uh, the hydropower in the island, it was actually the first uh, option back in the state fund, all right? And uh, our mechanical department is uh, named after uh, the engineer Stephanie. He was the first engineer that put together the first power plant to the island, hydropower in Carite, in the The capacity of the island to produce hydropower at the, uh, at the rates of demand uh, is very small. I mean, that is a reality. However, there, there are uh, uh, options and uh, there are uh, installed uh, options. Uh, perhaps it can be maximized, what we call micro hydropower. This is for farming and for very local generation. Uh, it's more likely that uh, the power generation from hydro uh, will have a significant impact in the larger economy because it's just, it's just not there. The island moves so fast uh, from the 40s to the 50s to a, a modern economy, or almost, almost modern economy. So that, uh, of course, is uh, mm -hmm. uh, goes along with uh, uh, demand per capita. And uh, the point that uh, is, is one of the, uh, uh, it's one of the places with the highest demand per capita. It's about one fourth of the U.S. Uh, if we consider that U.S. in average also takes into account the, the winter, then the electricity per capita is comparable to any uh, U.S. location, which we are the largest consumers of energy in the world per capita. This is by far, I teach that to my students in the first lecture of my sustainable energy class, and this is by far. So it, it could be part of a a, a, yeah, a small uh, contribution in the portfolio I mean, along the lines of uh, the uh, renewable. There is tremendous potential for uh, for wind capacity. This is beyond the island. This is for the entire island, and uh, I believe that a long-term solution uh, will. Uh, uh, We'll have to consider, we will have to consider uh, having the guts to install offshore our generation for not only for Puerto Rico but for all the islands. It's a natural resource that uh, nature uh, provides to the region because it has constant winds. And to capture those winds, uh, the best location is offshore. However, we just don't have the technology to provide that offshore solution with the resiliency that it requires under extreme weather events, uh, which challenges engineers and scientists to come up with a proper solution. Can we provide a, a large, a massive, large infrastructure offshore that at the same time is resilient, is durable? 
that is uh, no, is not vulnerable to this storm of Maria that they are going to come. Not every year, but they are going to come, and they're going to come more often, and they're going to come, they're going to come stronger. It's just the global issue of climate change and all of that is going to happen. So uh, this time was Puerto Rico. Next time maybe they are. Next time will be Cuba. Next time maybe all islands together. All right. So it's it's a region that is just exposed, and we're going to have to come up with really creative solutions uh, that will serve a larger uh, group of the of the of the whole region. I'm going to pass to Gail on that and just uh, yeah, there's an awful lot of expertise in, in this room, so I'm going to be uh, really fast. Uh, there's no reason why Puerto Rico can't have a renewable, clean, low gas, low cost, decentralized, and robust energy system. I, mean, it, I, I have not seen the numbers, but I would I would bet you know wind, solar, biomass, ocean uh, wave currents um, uh, are all there. And you have got the highly educated workforce. You know, University of Puerto Rico Mike West is one of the best engineering schools in, in the country. They have the Mars Project came from there. I've heard that half the brain surgeons from Houston came from there. I don't know that connection, but so I, I hear you've got a, a highly skilled uh, labor force. I mean, everybody over 25 years in Puerto Rico, every male has worked with concrete. They're building their houses or their, their families' houses. You have got, um, uh, and, and the technologies are there. I want to say we have to do energy efficiency first. We always got to think about energy efficiency first. And there's a lot of air conditioning in Puerto Rico. I'm not a, a big one on behavior solving the climate crisis, but it drives me nuts on a 95 degree day in Puerto Rico to go into a business meeting and see everybody wearing coats and ties <laughs> when Puerto Rico didn't invent the Guayabeta, which has, is the most useful, you know, a four pot, what can you, anyway, but there's some behavior that can help, but in terms of the, um, the technologies, not only, uh, oh, LEDs, you should be parachuting LED lights in Puerto Rico, so, and, they, and they could be, they pay for themselves in you know in less than a year. Okay, so mm -hmm. I'd like to take a, a question from the from the chat and then back to my audience. Uh, and uh, the colleague is asking, uh, what if? Yeah, there is a comment and question. What if? Uh, have we consider uh, decentralizing? And that's like the reason I like to take that. that Comment is decentralizing the system at the urban, let's say, at the city scale. And that's a very interesting uh, approach. Again, back to the uh, accidental example of uh, Maya West Town uh, now. Uh, one experience that uh, we had uh, during Sandy is that uh, I live in the South Shore of Long Island, so Rocket Center was powered. Uh, a day after the storm, uh, we have two weeks. Uh, most of my uh, village yeah. had two weeks without power. Yeah. Rocket yeah. Center was powered just right yeah. after me yeah. because yeah. they have yeah. a centralized system that is at the same time yeah. 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 a major uh, generator that powered the, uh, the the village. So uh, this is one of the solutions that uh, was suggested after Stanley for the whole region. Mary Code is promoting uh, what is called distributed generation, is to have micro resistance. And uh, if they, some of the towns across the island uh, will have their own generation, probably. And most of them will be powered with local generation. That also means that they are not going to be interconnected to a larger generation event. The grid provides options. And I believe that that's one of the lessons learned from Sandy that we can take back to the island in the reveal is to promote local generation. We call that on site generation, distributed generation and provides a, a, a range of options. One of the options is what we call combined hidden power. So if the island could provide a, some a particular major towns to with a, a pipeline of gas that will have a, some 
uh, redundancy in the system, perhaps most of the accounts uh, uh, could be powered by now. So those are options that are not only uh, being explored uh, in, uh, even here in our Northeast coast, but in, in, other, in other locations. So that gives a lot of other options for, for that, that critical infrastructure that is so dependent, hospitals, schools, all of this, so we can get the, 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 the economy back in, in place at a quick rate. Uh, as the major distribution system is uh, is uh, revealed, so this is uh, I think a great comment. Yeah, if I could just say, real quick, I, I I have about six companies that have these kinds of technologies that are putting to be like a, putting on this monthly event for ten years. I've got a, a bunch of technology that I can give you uh, examples of that, that that can do that. You know, as a power that does, it, it can take garbage. That's a you know, municipal. I know garbage. Sorry, municipal solid waste. Uh, Eighty, ninety percent of it can be used to generate ener energy or recycled, and the recycling will pay uh, for the unit, so it can be a you know what your finance it can be a zero cost. Uh, you've got uh, your air conditioning uh, that's an air conditioning that can uh, cut those costs by and can use by fifty percent. You've got um, I'm working with a, a thermal battery company which uses molten metal to. To transport energy, you can actually transport the energy you know, more cheaply than you could run cables. Although I know we've got the cables, it is there, and we need a place to kind of really put this together. How you restructure PREPA, what really does that? I don't know. I think it's one of the things we can talk about. And I'm gonna, uh, I, I got, I got. Oh, one other company I want to mention that, that needs help to become a company is, is um, for Q coefficient. It uses the the thermal mass of the building. Uh, to, to, to save energy. Essentially, you get yeah, heat, heats up during the day, or um, well, it cools down at night, and then you use that energy. Uh, to, I mean, the coolness that comes off of that. I'm sorry, I keep saying cool, I don't get that right. But to to uh, uh, cool down down your building, okay? And there are a lot of ways to do that because there is a lot of thermal mass around. Um, okay, I'm, I'm done. I know that they, there was I, some I really want to give you some questions about <laughs> those institutes. Some of you touched on um, today about the bankruptcy and the economic viability, which I think is critical. Um, my own thought about whether you have, from what I understand, a lot of the new CPS have a deal with Bank where they don't pay electricity because they gave them land in exchange for that. Like, whether you has a, an ice rink literally downtown. Is that part of the discussion? I mean, is that not really an energy discussion per se, but it's, yeah. it needs um, to be, right? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah they, they just do the housing, the authority. Provide service to the, to the uh, public, yeah, the public uh, agencies, uh, particularly the, the towns. I know as familiar on the subject, I perhaps. Yeah, I can touch on that. It'd be really interesting to see how that could be addressed with the microgrids. I do know that um, Puerto Rico is also talking about uh, decentralized and uh, distributed energy. Um, the Commission, Puerto Rico Energy Commission, last year approved an integrated resource plan for PREPA that included exactly this. Um, but it, they didn't talk about microgrid as a strategic, um, as we've been talking, or rather the professors have been talking about uh, the microgrids as a, is sort of a logistics evolution for distributing uh, energy, but rather due to decreased access to capital. This is really the only place where we can move. Now, why did we get, why are we discussing increased access or decreased access to capital when we're when addressing you know technological or, or environmental concerns yeah. or, or efficiency concerns for the grid? And it's, that's really the basis for everything that we've got in Prepa. If we don't finance Prepa adequately, if we don't restructure, and in this case, I believe due to the absolute devastation. Of the miles and miles of distribution and transmission lines, we should be talking about a cancellation of Prepa's debt because that was the infrastructure that was financed by by the debt that's still outstanding. I don't know why we would be discussing restructuring debt for a that doesn't exist. Right. So um, okay. well, we need to talk about financial reform. Exactly. May I? Um, my question is much more basic, and it's a fact. My name is Bill Alisea. The reason I am here is because I need to go back with an answer in the context of a 
emergency preparedness. We all go around this room that when Puerto Rico every year goes through its hurricanes. And it's the winds that brought this type of shit. But I would like to better understand and what it would cost and how a nonprofit could play an active role as to what it would cost to be able to set up an emergency grid box on the basis of a series of sensor tracks that would then translate into powerful water, into electricity, satellite phones, emergency services, so that in fact these communities, where you spot them on the map, not everyone is poor. There's those that are defending themselves. But how, what would it cost? What would it look like? So that I can put in place in my mind a proposal to be able to look at that, bring those resources to the table, and say, we are ready for next year with the number for the volunteer brigade. If we don't answer that question, then the rest is process paralysis, politics, and corruption. <laughs> So I ask you, that is part of the meeting. What would that model be? We look for the point on I'm sure these guys might want to add. Brooklyn, in Sandy, same thing, same story, right? No electricity, no cell towers. But these guys are, yeah, they make me jealous. They have a system. So uh, there's a Brooklyn microgrid right now. Um, it's, all like, it's all electric, it's a cooperative. Um, you know, it's very hippy. But it works, and they're not connected to the grid, but they'd like to plug in and contribute, right? And earn money. What, what's the data site? They also have the um, uh, uh, cell towers. How to set it up for after an emergency uh, with what you have. And so they actually teach you how to set up cell towers. Um, what would something like that cost? Because my question is very simple. I hear it. The technology is there. The resources are there. The dollars are coming in. So the question is, how does Puerto Rico prepare itself in a series of census tracts to be able to provide for the poor so that we no longer have to experience triage where our elderly and our internal but die and then report it out. And birth. <coughs> make a big call in a little bit. 50,000, 100,000, anyone have a sense? So I live off of in Fairfax County, Connecticut, uh, impacted by Sandy. A lot of my neighbors, I literally live off of the body water before, and a lot of my neighbors are going from Monroe all the way to Derby, off of the Tonic there, um, lost their houses due to the flooding, et cetera. And it was pretty bad in that area. And in my town, when I was on council, it cost a quarter of a quarter. Okay, so I'm looking for a quick moment. And it was, it was um, we got federal and <coughs> And now, finally, this is the first year that we have, we're 20% sustained. Well, the only way to give you a real answer to someone has to do with detailed analysis of what your energy usage is. Going to this point, first, you want to, you want to come as efficient as possible. Then, once you know what your usage is for your community, and you can probably speak to one of the solar companies in Puerto Rico or one of the other companies in Puerto Rico, to do that analysis for your community, then you can come up with a cost of what it would take to give you your solution. But without that detail, I can't give I you I understand that, but my question is more basic. There's 1,500 people living in La Pesa. There is no water, there is no electric. How do we be able to put an emergency grid in place? Not talking a lot, so that at least it's shared by the community and they can sustain themselves for 90 days. Very simple question, very simple model. I understand. Okay. On the bike, on the bike, right? Related to the 13 position at this point on the room now, and the gentleman's the offer that was made, and answering my question, I think you have to answer it. The offer that was made about two or three weeks ago, we were conducting an international investigation that we could put Puerto Rico, we could turn the lights on in three or four months. Remember that headline? Was that testimony? Yeah. Okay. So translate that for me. Tell me what that means. I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to comment on that. Yeah, 
so I think that goes to the point of whether we have a, we could have a system that is robust and resilient to the next storm or the next set of storms, right? And uh, the the case of a, a Puerto Rico uh, is one where the uh, distribution system is very exposed, and that makes a big impact. Uh, back to lessons learned, Sandy. We actually were out of power for a couple of weeks, but we had gas. All right, gas infrastructure is very resilient. It's not exposed. So some degree of protected distribution system will have to be required to sustain those winds. There is no system that will be exposed in terms of power grids that will sustain these type of storms. So those will have to have a strategic locations where we will have a protected distribution system. Again, back to the possibility of having a system that are independent but interconnected at the same time. Brooklyn example, all right? Those uh, locations where we will have unplugged from the major, the main distribution system, centralized, and uh, have a system that can run on, on its own because it was less affected, perhaps or perhaps a, a, it was a combination of a protected system. So the island, I think, and the islands, I think this is just a problem across the entire tropical band, particularly the Caribbean and Central America. We'll, we will need to, uh, as a part of the long-term solution, to have a system that is indeed very resilient to the next number of stones. Could be, could be more than one in a year. It's just nature is that way, and we have also stimulated the environment to a point that these things don't happen more and more often. And uh, it's impossible to have other education uh, protected, but if we have education in a relocation that will be can be can be put together back again in a matter of days, then we will have 50 percent of the island. The energy infrastructure back about water, back about communication is the central <laughs> infrastructure. We call this interconnected infrastructure. Without power, communication goes down. Without power, water goes down. Power is the uh, central bone of the, of the major infrastructure. So we have the power back. The basic service are going to come back uh, in that case. <laughs> Whether uh, the, 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 the the distribution will be all electrical or gas. I think it is, it's a point to be debated. I think we need to perhaps consider gas as part of the, of the solution too. Uh, so we have a system that is more, more diverse at the same time. Diversity also provides resiliency. To the point of San Juan, I believe that San Juan has the opportunity to have its own uh, microgrid because it's all on the ground. And all these distribution systems probably have very little damage. We need a power plant close by that can power the old town that is in the beautiful La Perla in that case. Of course, you know, that will not solve the, the housing issue, the damage in the property, of course. In, in reference to the distribution, I would think that San, all San Juan is playing one of the best positions to have a, a system that is very resilient and robust. Are you aware that the entire grid in Portugal is powered by sea currents. Totally. Right now. Our You're not aware of that. I am not aware of that. Please read about it. I will. I will. Then, another thing is, do you know who the largest producer of wind turbines is? Yeah. Oh. China. Yeah. The U.S. does not have the lead in manufacturing new technologies. That is China. So, I hear you from the perspective as, an, as a Wall Street energy analyst for the firms that have been sucking water in blood since 1898. I'm sorry, right? We don't need more of the same. If we don't get it now, we will be bleeding to death. We will, will disappear. This yellow and uh, orange entity is nothing new. There's even worse people on it. It's doing us a favor because it's 
blood up your face, right? So he's he lost 20 points in his approval rating. That's to our advantage. But if we keep on thinking that we were invaded by a benevolent entity, all right, not that by this orange thing, all right, who comes from Wall Street, all right, and that other lady who's a war criminal, all right, and so on, and all these war criminals that rule this country, we're finished. Okay, well, let me think. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I want, people should identify themselves. So, okay, we've we heard, we heard you. Let, let people identify, identify yourself. One, two. My name is Osvaldo Prince, and I work for Swan. Louder, louder. My, my name is Osvaldo Prince, and I work for a software company out of Cambridge. I was wondering if you could comment on the we have distribution grid that's sorely needed repair. And a lot of money is going into bringing back lights to an electrifying event. Where is that? How is that being done? Is there anything different being done in terms of reestablishing the distribution grid? Yeah. So the question is about whether what is being currently done, if I understand the question correctly, yeah. to get the uh, power in the short term solution. A large emergency situation now. How we get the, the power back? Uh, as, as we mentioned at the, uh, you know, the, on, the, on the table, uh, this has been the largest blackout in the history of the US. So this is a clear now need to restore the, uh, the distribution system, both the generation that probably was less affected than the distribution system that needs to be uh, restored back. And uh, uh, in the very short term, uh, uh, that should be the focus, is to get the power grid uh, back on. We can think about long-term solutions for the next set of storms, but there is a, a major a major need. And I think the focus is that, do we have enough amount power on the ground? Probably no. And uh, we probably will need uh, more support uh, from, uh, from crews that can get restored that the distribution line uh, back on place. Are we gonna have 100% in the short term? Probably no. Uh, my colleague Efrain uh, was uh, sharing with us that they project to have around 200 communities that will not be possible to restore power, not even in a year. So then we can think about those, uh, how to get those uh, communities power on the, perhaps on the mid-term solution, having micro risk for that community. But let's take a scenario for a second that we do restore the power in the next few months, right? That's a likely scenario. Will that prepare us for the next storm? Probably no. And that's where we need to then think about solutions and make it attractive to a, a international investor, make it attractive to a, a, a global leading technologies. So the system is robust, is resilient, is flexible, and is smart at the same time. And the island can become, the we can take this opportunity to make an example of the island. The infrastructure of the Puerto Rico is very similar to the rest of the island. Very similar. So whatever we learn from Puerto Rico, that can scale to the entire region. Again, Dominican Republic, we have a lot of friends. Haiti, of course, needs even more resources. If we think about Cuba, too, about 10, 40 million the Caribbeans there. Think about Central America at the same time. The storms are going eventually to come. So we, I think we need to have a, a, a phase a process a, on the emergency. There is no other solution. We will ha not have enough time to install enough solar panels in two months. The short-term solution is to get the grid back in place. The mid-term solution then is to have a resilience for the next set of storms. The long-term solution is to have a system for the future. For the percent I think the island and we all can continue to, to do this. This guy has this one. Okay, well, over here again. So let's go in this order, all right? Uh, my name is Noah Canavan. I'm a former chief technology officer with the city of New York. Um, I just want to make a short statement and then a question. Um, if what, part of what we want to do today is come up with some recommendations or uh, 
for the future. Uh, I don't think we can, none of us can really accept coal being any part of the political energy future. Um, as someone who has close family and friends in Guayama and Salinas, I can tell you that what Armando said about the history of that coal plant and the uh, negative side effects of that coal plant is very extremely accurate. Um, not to mention that the economics um, every day become less and less uh, desirable. Um, my question really is about the future. Um, what is the current state of power generation from wave energy? And could that play any part? question is about wave energy, so uh, I'm going to respond to the question and perhaps my colleagues, but I'm going to take a, a, a another question and then combine it with the, the answer. So in the back there, yes? Concerns that I, I, I do right now. And I, I really appreciate that you are exploring these different points. Is how this is implemented on the island. Because what I have said on the island is that sometimes in implementation of <laughs> processes, new technologies and new ideas have been disincentivized. The fact they're being passed. So we have to develop <laughs> powers within good political. Uh, there's a vested interest to maintain the status quo. How do we, as a diaspora, okay, can develop strategies to influence those entrenched powers to make some change, to make sure that Chapeta, if there is agreement that Chapeta is done, to make sure that those 200 sites that you told me, Efraim mentioned in Puerto Rico, that we can bypass those entrenched powers and try to help them. What is it, what kind of ideas, how, what kind of strategy do you want to implement so that we make a concerted effort to really protest those issues as a diaspora and not have to deal with the entrenched system that is there in the future? Thank you, also. So I'm going to have a quick uh, uh, response to the question of wave energy. And uh, uh, my understanding of that is uh, I review a number of technologies that we we still very early stage, and uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of research. Uh, actually, schools here in the northeast are the leading. The Rhode Island University has a very good group of conducting that. We're not there yet. Uh, it is a it's, it's going to be a technology as part of the a, a, you know mid 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 future, not long term future, but mid future. So it is something that we should get a very attention. Yeah. I'm going to have to let my colleague to perhaps respond on how the, uh, what are the processes to uh, uh, incentivize uh, new technologies and perhaps uh, Miguel needs to comment also on how we, uh, how we can contribute to make that system uh, that is, uh, uh, can allow the, the, the energy distribution to be robust and also uh, resilient. Okay. Um, so, from the experience, very limited experience that I've seen in, in, in PREPA specifically, I can't talk too much about and many other grids, but PREPA specifically, a lot of the investment that you see come in isn't really a new technology. A lot of uh, the technology that's being brought in really only centers around the profitable, profitable aspects of the, of the industry. So, one of some of the things that we've been discussing here is how do you make distribution, how do you make transmission more logical, more reasonable, more cost effective, but there's not really new money going into distribution systems. There's not a lot of money going into transmission uh, power line technologies, right? Um, there aren't really very smart ways to go around environmental concerns, which is digging up 31,000 miles worth of power lines. So what needs to happen is to, uh, the incentives, I believe, are misplaced. Instead of incentivizing new technologies for generation, which I think need to happen, and those are already there, um, to increase capacity for battery storage, increase capacity for wave, for, uh, wave energy production, et cetera. You also need to be looking at the other, and 
when you're designing tax incentives or other incentives, you need to be looking at aspects of the industry that aren't attractive already to investors who are looking for a quick profit. So these are the aspects of the energy that are really looked into and that um, in Puerto Rico have suffered greatly because the only ones taking on that risk is the public. And we're over indebted. So it, that, that that would be my two cents. Yeah, on the how the diaspora, we're gonna have to be shutting down soon. Oh yeah, for ten people. I believe that perhaps it's is to bring in our own best experiences, uh, best practices uh, in the uh, management of the uh, energy infrastructure. And uh, one example is the California Energy Commission. So the commission is very empowered to uh, regulate the the energy infrastructure. In, in this case, the commission in Puerto Rico has very little authority over the uh, the prepa. So the, the prepa is really the, the one that is uh, 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 dictating the policies and, and the practices. So we need a more community-based, I, I believe, community-based uh, uh, organization that can dictate the, the policies for the future. And we can then take into account uh, financial, uh, financial aspects, also environmental aspects. We have the New York Rice Erda, all right? So we have these best practices that we are somehow uh, exposed to or even contributing to. Uh, New York City has a very active climate change panel, as maybe you have heard from that, where there is a lot of detailed stories about the impact of the uh, extreme weather events, for example, into the critical infrastructure. Can we bring these best practices because we are part of those uh, uh, conversations that uh, into into the into the island as uh, the island uh, we, we built and also financing. I think this will probably if, if the island opens up to uh, new ideas, that will bring uh, uh, clearly opportunities for new investment and perhaps the diaspora can also be part of that in their uh, through uh, groups or private sectors, uh, funding groups. As the ones that some of those are, are, are exposed. And that's a, uh, you want to add in this? I, I, yes. A couple things. One, there's a really nice piece that gets into the financing and the, and the economics of, of the energy we build in Puerto Rico. It comes from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, um, and their Political Economy Research Institute. And I think Edwin's going to put it on, or it'll be on the Central's uh, website. Uh, I want to ask, I know that uh, the City College is doing, is doing some things. I think there is an uh, urban city like you guys did. I don't know if there's class actually involved in Puerto Rico, but we have a lot of expertise in the room. Just a couple of words about what they're doing, and I think you know where we come together to try and, and make all this happen, and how on earth do you change PREPA, or you know, take over PREPA, I don't know. The financing can be done. There is an Article 2022, uh, now in Puerto Rico that added, gives huge subsidies to wealthy people to move to Puerto Rico because they're and actually you know establish residence there and then any income then invest in Puerto Rico because any income they get from Puerto Rico is tax free no Puerto Rican taxes no federal taxes okay they're, they're really amazing there are ways we can we can work this system I still don't know how to take over prepa but anyway let me uh, David say a word about the Earth Institute say a word about city and then we got three and then we'll have to be closing down. Yeah, we're yeah. giving a few more minutes because we started labeling. We're going to have to close it down in the house. Thank you very briefly. I work with the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and I think the best way to describe it is we're just trying to understand all the different stuff that's going on and the best way to put it together. We don't have the answers necessarily. We want to make sure we help facilitate everything and augment, I think, is our original intention. Mm -hmm. And so, quick in regards to local generation um, and immediate. I'm sorry, but I'm going to say I'm an architect in New York City. But we've been looking at hiking, uh, hikers, you know, they do when they go on these long hikes, and they have these like micro wind turbines that can sort of be, you know, deployed and, and taken out down. And like, I, is there any talk about like, you know, dropping them down and pulling them places like on the mountain? No, that I'm aware of. Like that would be great. It's really quick. At least power your phones and like little things. Oh, that's it. You would like to explain the effects uh, of the phone tool and how that plays in this. I just want to understand what what it means. Okay, okay. I will. I will get some comment on this. Yeah. It sounds like it fits in. Yeah. If I 
yeah. another yeah. another uh, yeah. venue question. Yeah. I had a general <laughs> question, which is how much potential for power damage? So what I mean, I gather you need about five gigawatts of power per hour. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. are they more suitable for microgrids? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to combine the answer. We're probably going to close down with that. Uh, in terms of the solar capacity, my colleague Frank has done a number of uh, studies about the capacity for solar. And uh, uh, there is, uh, if we install a, a solar panel at every roof in the island, there is enough a solar resource with existing technologies, so photovoltaic conversion, 20% conversion or so, to, uh, uh, to power the entire residential sector. And uh, perhaps uh, not at the rate for industrial, but it's, I would say 50%, assuming that that, uh, that scenario is a likely scenario, but it, it's gonna be hard to get to that point. But it, in the broader answer is there is a plenty song to have a major contribution on the on the uh, energy capacity. Now, keep in mind that solar uh, is uh, produces energy when the sun is up. So we will need a combined system that uh, can then absorb some of the storage requirements, which lead me to the point of Tesla. So Tesla core technology is uh, is batteries. Actually, the the automobile is uh, is. Uh, uh, is is a, a secondary core technology. The enabled technology of Tesla is the, the storage system. And now they bought Solar City, which is the largest solar uh, residential installer. They made it the whole one company now. So I believe that Mr. Uh, uh, Moss will be suggesting that he can power the island with the sun and batteries. It's a questionable proposal. I think. Uh, 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 it requires uh, 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 more more than uh, uh, storage and and and, and solar panels to uh, uh, to power the entire uh, island. But it's an interesting approach, consistent to the to what uh, the, the last question. So, so the solar uh, portfolio could play a major role, and I think in that regard, Tesla could play a, a major a role as any other solar company, major solar company. And that, that could uh, make it available. Now, the, the, having access to storage then give us more flexibility too. It is the storage at a level that can absorb the entire uh, energy? Probably no. Uh, We're not there yet. So, but soon we, no. we probably can combine storage with uh, uh, with solar uh, generation and perhaps even wind that also requires some type of. Uh, a, a system to store some, some of the energy. So with that, uh, I think we need to close down. So I wanted to thank Where's your uh, sign up sheet? Yeah. Cheers. Okay, is it done? No. I think so. yeah. Anybody yeah. not? Thank you. Okay, that's your, your responsibility. Back to you to be coming this way. I'll, I'll thank you very much. Oh, thank you. All right, thank you.